say this. Uh, the 19th Sunday after the Pentecost, also the, the first Sunday in October. So in the new month, we move to divine service setting four. Uh, we'll play together. Uh, that's page 203. Go ahead, Mark. Your hymn is page 203. Uh, we begin with our first hymn, 685. 685. Christ, 
in the fellowship of this altar, let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us. Almighty God in His mercy has given His Son to die for you and for His sake forgives you all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by His authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We speak together the introit. The introit is printed on the back of our bulletin. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. We all children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb of the poor. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who builds his quiver with him. He shall not be able to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. Glory be Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. We continue on page 204 as we sing, Lord, have mercy, followed by the glory.
You may be seated. The Old Testament lesson I'm uh, pointed for today is uh, from the book of Genesis, chapter 2. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. So out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was his name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he, while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up his place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked, and were not ashamed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This lesson is uh, from the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 2. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard. While God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to His will. Now, it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere, What is man that you are mindful of him? For the Son of Man that you care for him. You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now, in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the father of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one origin. This is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. Since, therefore, the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil. And deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to life all <coughs> For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers 
in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. This is the word of the Lord. We turn in our hymn to page 205. Page 205. And please stand as we sing our hallelujah verse.
be seated. We sing our next hymn, 863. 863. Nothing more than to have 
have a visitor in your home again. What would it be like to walk a mile in your shoes? Maybe you are the person going through a serious illness. You aren't sure what the future might bring. What would it be like to walk a mile in your shoes? Maybe you are the outwardly appearing, highly successful person, and yet it is so extremely hard to keep it all going. What would it be like to walk a mile in your shoes? See, if we think in this way about others, we might begin to understand why it is they do what they do. Again, not to make an excuse for bad behavior, but to simply put ourselves in their place. Maybe it would influence us to visit someone who might be lonely. Maybe it would get us to offer a helping hand to busy people. Maybe it may cause us to write an encouraging note or letter to cheer someone up. You can't understand me unless you walk a mile in my shoes. Let us never use this as an excuse for our own bad behavior. Rather, let us always use this rule to understand others around us. Because in fact, this very old adage, you can't understand me unless you walk a mile in my shoes, that just happens to be the core subject of Hebrews chapter 2. See, we read the entirety of chapter 2 this morning. So, in Hebrews chapter 2, we find that in the Lord Jesus Christ, in Him, God, the creator of heaven and earth, the all-powerful, the almighty, the all-knowing, the all-present, that God literally walked in the shoes of us human creatures. And as we will see, that is the most loving thing that he could ever have done. But this is uh, verse 8 of chapter 2. I'm going to read it. Verse 8 of chapter 2. Now, in putting everything in subjection to him, that is Jesus, God left nothing outside his control. At present, though, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. Now, that's a lot to comprehend right there. But we can boil that whole verse down to this. That in Jesus, God walked in our shoes. So let's break that down a little bit more. Okay, now in putting everything in subjection to him, that is Jesus, God left nothing outside his control. This is a very fancy way of saying that Jesus, as he lived his human earthly life, was still God. And he had all God powers. He could do all the God stuff that he wanted. And at times he did. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He turned water into wine. He even had it command over the wind and the waves creation itself. But yet, at other times, Jesus didn't use his God powers when he could have. For example, on the cross, the crowd was mocking him. The, the others on the two other crosses, one was shouting at him, aren't you the Son of God? Don't 
you have God powers, then get yourself down. But he didn't. Rather, Jesus suffered and died to walk a mile in our shoes. The Hebrews chapter 2 goes on. It says this. For it was finished that he, that's Jesus, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons, that's all of us, to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through, and get this, how does God make, or how does Jesus make our salvation perfect? It says through suffering. So what did God do when he walked in our shoes? He suffered. In the Lord Jesus Christ, God, the creator of heaven and earth, the all-powerful, the almighty, the all-knowing, the all-present, that God suffered like you and me. So have you ever been tired? Yeah. Well, so has God. Even as we see Jesus so tired that he went to sleep in the stern of a boat while winds and waves were crashing about. For we think of the weariness of Jesus as he was walking up Mount Calvary with that cross on his back. For how about this? Have you ever been Lonely? Well, so has God. Uh, as all of the disciples abandoned Jesus on the night he was betrayed, even Peter, Peter, the rock, denies Jesus and leaves him alone. But even on the cross, Jesus screams out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because God did. Or have you ever mourned the death of a loved one? So has God. You know, the shortest verse of the Bible is, Jesus wept. And why did Jesus weep? Because his friend Lazarus died. And he was sad about it. And Jesus felt the emotions of pain and loss that death brings. And so then in Jesus, therefore, God himself knows exactly what it is like to feel sick or tired, or sad, or lonely. God knows what it feels like when we mourn the death of a loved one. Amen. Hebrews 2, verse 14. Since therefore the children, that's us, share in flesh and blood, he, that's Jesus, and then through Jesus, that is God himself, he himself likewise partook of the same Things that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. So it isn't just that Jesus has walked a mile in our shoes through weariness or sickness or sadness or loneliness or loss. No. Most importantly, the most importantly, Jesus walks in our shoes even through death. That in Jesus, God died just like we all will die. So that God knows what it feels like and has experienced it himself. But here is the thing. Jesus didn't deserve to die. 
So we know that the wages, that is, the payment that we rightly receive, the wages of sin, and sin is that the work that we do that earns those wages, the wages of sin is death. That we all will rightly die because we have sinned. But Jesus, however, did not sin. And so did not earn the wages of death, which he took upon himself. And this very thing, that Jesus died a death he didn't earn or deserve, that itself is death's undoing. The perfect death of Jesus has conquered death of all of us. So when Jesus walked in our shoes through death, he broke them. <coughs> and since he broke them, he has given us eternal life in the forgiveness of our sins. So I'd like to leave you with this. Knowing that God has walked more than a mile in each of your shoes. That he has been in every situation that you have experienced, even death. Here's how Hebrews 2 ends. Therefore, Jesus had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make sacrifice for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are also being tempted. Amen. Now may the peace of God surpass all human understanding, guard our hearts and minds in the one true faith, even until life everlasting. Amen. And we now take a moment to worship our God with our times and walk.
like little children, that we may enter it in the joy of your forgiveness in Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, that we may pay closer attention to your word, lest we drift away from it and neglect the great salvation it reveals to us in Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, help us when we do not see everything in the world in subjection to Jesus. Give us eyes of faith to see him crowned with glory and honor at your right hand, and so believe that nothing is outside of his control. Lord, in your mercy, <coughs> Lord God, grant healing and comfort to those in need. We pray especially for Marvin, Marilyn, Jill. Ethley, Tom, Laura, Bill, Larry, and all others who suffer body or mind. You made the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering, that in all their trials they might put their trust in you. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Lord God, deepen all who eat and drink Christ's body and blood today in the truth that he has made them bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh, that they may not doubt but believe that he will hold fast to them forever. Lord, in your mercy. In your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our service continues as we begin the service of the sacrament. It's on page 208, page 208. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and grace. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should, in all times and in all places, give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death in the grave. And by his glorious resurrection, open to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we Lord, and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, In the same manner after supper, he also took the cup, 
And after he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples and said, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always.
continues on page 211. Page 211. Please stand as we sing.